Okay. Uh, can people hear me? Hello? Anyone out there? All right. So, great, great, great. Sounds good then. So I'm looking at the audience and, uh, and I see people who already know everything there is to know about, and actually more than me, about all the various respects about config files like Robert at the back there. Um, but I'm going to go through this anyway because I always have this difficulty doing, because I, I kind of want to do a presentation which is actually, I shouldn't say it like that, <laughs> actually useful. Um, no, I, I want to do a presentation which is, it's actually practical, but at the same time, I, I, I'm afraid of pitching it at a point where everybody attending is actually going to know all this stuff already and, and, uh, and, uh, and won't be interested. So we'll see how it goes. So I'm probably going to end up finishing a little early, and then we can just kind of, I, I guess, kind of answer any kind of questions. Okay. Um, Parcel audio still okay for other people? Yeah. Okay. In that case, I am going to start starting. Um, get the inventory box. Okay, so basically, this is a talk about configuration, which is an exciting subject and one which uh, anybody who does anything on OpenSIM gets to know in uh, intimate detail sooner or later. So, I'm going to talk about basically some of the background of how this configuration system came about. A kind of a, a, an overview of the structure of the system, how the different config files kind of include and load each other, um, and then a review of some of the significant configuration param parameters, which I should say will be hopefully some of the more obscure ones of varying levels of usefulness depending on who you are. Um, but there will also be a Q&A, so if anybody really does want to talk about anything configuration related, exciting as that prospect is, um, that'll be the point. Or any other kind of parameters they've always wanted to ask about uh, as to why they're there or what they do. And, and I may or may not know, because to be honest, there's so many of them that I really don't know what they all do. Um, okay. Whoa. Whoa, wrong slide. Fantastic. Uh, I knew I should have reordered the numbering in here. Okay. Oh, I see. They probably loaded in the order I wasn't expecting them to. Okay. Right, you're going to experience a small delay while I go through a couple of slides. Yes, basically because my slides are, are misordered. Um, because I think I made a mistake, not because I just relo reloaded them, and I didn't. I made a mistake of not of not fixing the numbering properly. Yeah. Yeah, it's a quick presentation. All right, great. So I'm going to make a couple of assumptions in this talk because it is a it is a low level detail kind of talk. I'm going to assume you've run your own open simulator, so you know what I'm talking about, and aren't aren't thinking what 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 is this config crap he's on about. Um, I, you, I'm going to assume you're familiar, and this isn't really that important, but I am going to assume you're familiar with what what terminology like the high level stuff as it were, in OpenSIM, like standalone grid and hypergrid. In fact, hypergrid's not actually necessary, but so standalone and grid. I'm going to assume that you know that OpenSimulator relies on configuration files, such as OpenSim.ini. If you don't know what OpenSim.ini is, then uh, this probably isn't going to make a lot of sense, this talk, to be honest. Um, and that you're familiar with .ini file structure. And by that, I mean, well, actually, I'm going to go to... I go to the yeah I go to the example no I'm going right what I'm going to do friend is talk I'm actually going to try the media on a prim I'm actually going to try coding not coding I'm trying to go and try config file stuff in Google Docs which may or may not be a good idea and if it's a bad idea we'll uh, we'll have to abandon that oh that doesn't work very well okay um, so I'm going to bring up in fact this first screen now and. Is that appearing for people? Yes, I kind of... Uh, so some of you and some viewers might actually need to click it. It shouldn't matter. You should be able to see it, but you might actually need to click the thing. Yeah.
Okay, if you're not, yeah, if you're not seeing it yet, you you kind of have to click on it, and then it appears. Yeah, it seems to depend on the viewer. Some of them will just display it, and some of them, for some reason, you have to click on it. Okay, so, uh, okay, Nick, um, I just carry on for now, but hopefully, actually, what I will say will actually make sense, even if you can't see the media on a prim. Because to be honest, I I originally made a presentation thinking I wouldn't I wouldn't do media on a prim. Um, so, I mean, by, an, by a config file, I just mean something like this. This is a, a very basic snippet of a config file where, of a .ini file where you kind of have the heading, kind of different sections in square brackets or, or braces or bra well, brackets they are, I guess, technically, uh, such as start up here. And then you have, then the, uh, then the lines starting with uh, kind of a semicolon are comments for various reasons. There's double semicolons here. And, uh, and um, then the actual parameter, the actual parameter here is commented um, which I could actually change. This is where, this is where, in theory, doing it like this will actually be useful. Um, and I'm going to wait for that to appear on my screen. So I did it in my, in my web browser, and and you're going to appear. Is that going to? What's it going to say? It's saying, you idiot. You're actually editing this elsewhere because you've gone to the edit link. You fool. Okay. Um, what? Really popular? No, it isn't. Okay. So. That's not the best thing in the world, where we're not actually transmitting changes. It's going to make this slightly less useful. All right. So the URL, yes, I could paste the URL in the in the uh, in the notes. That might be useful. Um, I'm just going to try actually pasting in without the edit link here, because that doesn't really help anybody, at least or me. Um, Right, because the other thing is, this isn't the easiest thing to actually switch back and forth. So if this ends up taking too much time, I will abandon this particular idea. Okay, so let's see. I just actually reloaded the page. So if it's gone away from you, you might need to click it again. And I'm just going to put some random gibberish uh, in here and see if it actually transmits, if it actually resyncs. And it might not resync for me, and it might resync for you. This is not. This actually did, did this work when I tried it. This did work when I tried it, and it's not very happy now, for whatever reason. Does anybody see any random gibberish? Yeah, that 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 did happen, but then I also wrote some random gibberish in there and that for yeah that's what it should say and of course this is the thing where everybody's going to see a slightly different view of the uh of the actual thing including myself which doesn't really help okay i'm gonna i'm not gonna i'm not gonna assume that i'm gonna keep trying it but i'm not gonna assume that it's actually gonna show changes but i think it's still useful okay i'm gonna switch back to the presentation so if if people start losing track do say in the chat and I will, yeah, that's what it should say. For some reason, it doesn't say it for me, the random gibberish. Um, okay, so if people, if that gets too much for people, please do say in the chat, and I will I will kind of abandon it, because it does mean switching a lot between these screens. And to be honest, it's probably going to... Anyway, we'll see how we go. Okay. So I'm now going to try and switch back. And hopefully, it's actually going to let me, because it won't be very useful if it doesn't. All right. Did the screen disappear for anybody? In fact, maybe I could click one of these things. Okay. All right. I might just try and restrict the use of that to the stuff where it's actually most useful because I'm not sure it's working all that well. Okay. So those were the assumptions. So yeah, you know what an any file through file structure looks like. Okay, so in terms of background, and, and really I'm not saying anything that unobvious, I think, is that like many, many things in OpenSIM, it's an evolved and evolving system that has to suit a number of purposes. So for instance, um, standalone operation, we want to ide ideally, and, and this is the way we try and do it at the moment, ideally out of the box, you start OpenSIM, you don't need to do much, if any, configuration at all. 
And assuming you've downloaded the binary package and it works because the config files are set up already, all the config files are set up so that standalone works as you would expect. But it also needs to be able to kind of be widely adapted for, you know, the grid instance. If you to run multiple simulator instances, so so instead of connecting to a standalone um, simulator, are connecting to a grid and backend services with things like uh, robust.ini, which is another configuration file I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And it's got, and it wants to do things like separate the commonly changed parameters, like what if you're using MySQL, what data, the MySQL database, what uh, what parameters you're using to connect, and and a lot more obscure parameters like changing the number of physics frames it processes per 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 um, per um, um, per second, which is not normally something you want to you want to be fiddling with, um, unless you really want to you know, try and debug something or you you really know what it's doing. So it, it kind of needs to re, it kind of needs to fulfill quite a, quite a number of different purposes, and it's evolved to do this. So the structure of a, of an e file is is kind of a cascading structure. So oh, that's interesting. I didn't delete that text. Okay, right. We'll go back to it in a second. Okay. So the structure is kind of a, a cascading structure. So so for example, in grid mode, in fact, we can't ignore this text because. I have it here. Basically, any files end up including each other. Not in each other. Uh, they end up including other any files. So, so in this particular diagram, for instance, um, and I hope you can actually read these slides because I, I kind of I try to keep the conceit of a world tour and, and get some. Actually, all these pictures are from OpenSim. Many of them are from um, Annabelle Fanshaw, who's, who very kindly provided them. But you can't really see them because I had to grade them out to get the text on. So, yeah, that was all great. Um, so the kind of the structure of one of these things is that you see OpenSim at the bottom there, and what always happens is that OpenSim defaults to any is loaded first, and that's the file which contains a lot of the expert and debug parameters. Um, if you go through that, for instance, the physics ones I mentioned, or or things like actually making sure you you can bump into any objects and um, and a lot of that kind of detailed stuff. So that's loaded separately, and, and normally we don't ask people to change that, and then. Apart from that, OpenSim.ini is loaded, and, and I'm talking the Open Simulator simulator instance here. OpenSim.ini is loaded, which, which you're very f familiar with, and that's copied from .ini.example. But that in itself, if you've ever looked at the bottom, and you kind of have had to do this if you actually want to run it in grid mode, unless somebody gave you your .ini file, um, there's a number of kind of include lines, and one of those is to include a file. At, and I'm, I'm assuming these are all in the bin directory, of course, as I'm sure you know. So one of those lines, for instance, if you want to run it in grid mode, is to instead of including standalone.ini, you include grid.ini, which is a bunch of um, a bunch of configuration lines for actually telling the simulator, hey, I want to connect to a grid, and not to uh, and not to actually use in-process kind of services like asset or inventory, and then that in itself also then goes on to include grid common.ini, which is the file you would actually change to put in the parameter like where you want to the the um, the IP address of your kind of Backend robust services in this case, uh, which is the file you'd actually change, and then ask you why it's called grid common any. Maybe I don't know. At the time, I thought it could have been better named, but we'd already gone down that road. And to be honest, I don't know. Changing it, changing any files is a, is, a, is a nightmare. I've already tried it years ago, and, and nobody was very happy. Um, and then itself can also include a, a file called flotsam cache which is the standard caching for OpenSim. Um, and normally you don't need to do that, but if you want to change those parameters, you could kind of copy that dot example file, flotsam cache in the example, and, and then end up editing that. So already it's a pretty complex structure. And as a uh, and if I go on to the next slide here, um, so you see that a lot of those files are kind of included from each other. Um, but when they're included, somewhat maybe counterintuitively, they're always kind of merged afterwards and not in line. So if you had a include and I really could ideally would show you what an include line looks like, but I'm not going to switch to the media on a prim or try that just yet. But ideally, they would kind of, you know, as you would expect in the programming language, they'd actually be included in line so that if you had config file, config parameters after your include line, then they would override the ones in the include. But unfortunately, because OpenSim kind of, because OpenSim kind of adds this to the library itself rather than like the kind of, the config reading library doing it, which is called Nini or NINI, -NI, um, then we can't do that. So we end up merging them after, which can be counterintuitive. Um, but it's also the case that later identical parameters overwrite earlier ones. So that's why you can you can put in 
uh, why we why we kind of suggest that instead of ever going and editing opens and defaults to any, if you do want to change any of those kind of less uh, less commonly changed config things, you do it in OpenSim.ini instead, and that's that works because OpenSim.ini is loaded afterwards and then overwrites anything that was in defaults if there are if there are settings with exactly the same parameters, or rather there are there are identical um, attributes. Um, and so we also know that region files themselves are loaded from somewhere else. In this case, uh, the kind of bin regions directory, and they're a little different. Um, and some of the settings there can override. And they kind of sorry, they they kind of name the actual uh, the actual region name and the UUID. And and you're I'm sure you're all very familiar with that because unless you, although maybe some of the distributions actually manage that for you. But if you're just using Vanilla OpenSim, you end up editing those files. And, uh, and some of them have settings to override main file settings, uh, by which I mean open similar any settings primarily, uh, like non-physical prim max, so that you can change the, um, the maximum size of a non-physical prim in one region, but not in another. And, and the other would use the defaults, or the rather ones in OpenSim.ini. So now I'm going to talk about a few of the various different config parameters. And, and, and as you know, there are hundreds of these things, all of different levels of importance and and some of them don't even work uh, hopefully those are actually pretty rare but i know there are a couple which don't work um so i'm just going to talk about a few of these um and some of them you might find useful and some of them you think i really know that already you're an idiot why are you even talking um or of course some stuff you might think that's actually not at all useful justin what are you talking about um so i'm going to switch i'm going to try switching back to the media on a prim now i actually need to switch I actually need to click it, I think. And then I did practice this. But I must admit, in practice, it didn't work that well either. Um, all right, now you want me to re-click you again. OK, great. All right, come on. Ah, I don't want the edit bit. All right. OK, so actually, this is just going to be if hopefully people can see this. And of course, you might need to click it. Um, so this is my Google Doc, and this, oh my god, it disappeared. Um, right, it's back. Oh, I've got the random gibberish, which doesn't really help. Um, right, delete that, for God's sake. It really th it thinks this page is really popular, but I can't think it's that hugely popular, unless 20 people or whatever is enough to actually trigger that. Maybe it is. Um, so you might need to ignore the random gibberish for a second, but this is the first very basic thing. I, I think some time ago, uh, I think it was actually Dan. Dan said that it would be useful to be able to rename the console prompt so he knew what he was looking at. I think when he looked at one of the one of the one of his many simulators, or one of, maybe one of the ones on the right plaza. So um, yes, so this is one of the things which actually, uh, like a bash prompt, you can kind of change the name of the console console prompt a little bit. For instance, the default here, if you ignore the random gibberish line for a second, is region slash r, so that's why you see region and then the region name in brackets. But you could conceivably change that um, to whatever you like, like this is Dan Simulator and the region name, or, you know, why have we got a console prompt and a log in the same screen? That doesn't really make, that's just, it's, what the hell are you doing? Um, any kind of prompt you like. Right, so I'm going to try switching back. Does it say Google Doc login? Oh, man, this should be a public doc, that's the thing. Um, Oh man, okay, I'm just gonna, one second, maybe this is why it's not being very happy. Um, so I'm just gonna check, right, it thinks that it is public on the web, but maybe I'm using the wrong link. That could be why I'm, yeah, I think that uh, it wants me to do something slightly different. Okay, well, we'll try this link. Let me just paste this in here a second. Though actually, it wants me to click and then go back again. Okay. Right. Ah. All right. So I don't know if people can see that. All right, because I actually pa pasted the link that Google wants me to use when I'm showing in the public, which might be a better idea, I admit, rather than pasting whatever happens to be in the, the um, address bar. All right. <laughs> Unfortunately, I have to touch it because I have to now switch off it again. 
Or do I'm, uh, right, you might have to click your screen, Toyok, if uh, at least try that. Okay, I'm just going to try a little bit of editing to see if that would actually work. And sorry, I know I'm stretching your patience here. Um, because this did work for me in the test. Okay, I will paste the link, yes. So the actual link, yes, if you actually want to use a web browser, um, then that's the actual document link. Okay, I'm not sure this is actually uh, um, this is actually syncing up here. Okay, well, if I do have a white, white screen, please do bear with me, um, and hopefully it will still make sense anyway. Um, so yeah, it's a console problems one. So if I actually go to something more in, in fact, why don't I just keep it on the media on a prim? That would make a hell of a lot more sense to me switching back and forth to the presentation, wouldn't it? Okay. So in fact, can people still see that? If they are seeing it. Okay. Anybody, any, any luck with seeing that? You can, I see, I told you, I told you this was not a good idea. All right. I'm going to assume people can see that. And if you can't, tell me. Okay, great. Um, and yes, you can see in an external browser. So, aye, man, yes, it, I thought that's what might have happened. Okay, I'm going to try and bring it back. I'm sorry about this. But I thought, you know, experimental conference, why don't we have an experimental presentation as well? Because that would be a great idea. All right, I'm just, I'm just, I told it to bring the page back now. Okay. So hopefully people will be able to see that. It might appear white again, which is thrilling. Um, and I'm going to actually find the page with all these bits on. Okay, great. So the other, the next kind of parameter I think I'm, oh my God, where did it go? All right, I've got a blank page now. Okay, I'm just about on the verge of I think it's going to say, yes. Um, okay, I'm just going to continue this a bit longer, but if it blows up, then I'm going to abandon this particular approach. Right. So I'm actually going to replace this. Oh, man, it's not going to update. Okay, right. I'm giving up on the media on a prim. It's not going to work today. I'm going to go back to the presentation. Sorry about that, folks. Right. It's going to be a little less obvious because you're going to have to imagine slightly exactly where in the file I'm talking about some of this stuff. Yes, I've, well, I've now taken it off screen. So you should be seeing... Yeah, you, you should be seeing the presentation again now. Okay. Right. So the next, um, the next setting I did want to talk about is async core method. Now, this is much more obscure. Um, what this does is control the thread pool used by the core system. So I say the core system because the X engine, X engine uh, script engine actually uses a different uh, thread pool. Now, by default, we actually use a thread pool called a smart thread pool. Um, and anybody actually looking at the web browser can see this because I pasted in the, uh, the text. But... Essentially, the smart thread pool is is a kind of like a separate pool of threads in a in a different packet in, in a different, not actually part of the runtime package itself, which uh, which was available for use. And originally, when we were many years ago, when OpenSim uh, was a bit younger than it was now, um, the version of mo the mono was also quite immature, and the thread pool in that did not work well. So we used the smart thread pool. But some people on Windows report that it works a lot better um, with a pool. We have a setting here called unsafe queue user work. And fun, I put some of this in the chat. That might actually help. Uh, called unsafe queue user work item. Uh, and this is in the startup section, which actually on Windows does work a lot better. Because, Well, I, I say that, but there are reports on Windows it does work better because it uses Windows inbuilt thread pool instead of this other software package. And a mono, some people report it's fine and some people report it isn't. So that's why we're stuck with um, the default setting, which is a smart thread pool. But if you actually want to experiment, then that might actually improve in performance on Windows. 
Um, and so the first setting we're going to talk about here is one some people will be familiar with, which is combined contiguous regions, otherwise known as uh, mega regions. And this is the setting which says for any square set of regions you've got in the sims, so say you had um, ones between, say you had ones at 1,000, 1,000, uh, 1,000, 1,001, 1,001 and 1,000, and 1,001 and 1,001, which would actually, if you set this setting to true, combined contiguous regions equals true, then those would all be combined into one mega region, and you would be able to move in the viewer seamlessly between them. Um, but it is a bit of a, and, and two of us, I'm sure you're excuse you saying this, is a, is, is a hack in the best sense of the word. It's a clever hack, but it's not perfect, because we do have kind of teleport issues and some other issues with that. Um, but if you do use that flag, then you can actually move between regions seamlessly at the expense probably of some, maybe some loss of performance in terms of physics engine. Yeah, so the difference between those, Latif, in, in C Sharp, so I've read about this, and the difference is basically a privilege escalation. Um, if you don't, now I can't remember the exact details, unfortunately, but essentially, if I think you're running code that you don't completely trust, um, then in some cases, then if you allow it, if you do unsafe queuing you, uh, work items, then it is able to actually escalate privileges. But if you use safe, then, or rather, just queue user work item that it isn't. But in our purposes, unless you're unless you're running, unless you're actually trusting trusting DLLs from other regions, which would be kind of crazy if you don't actually control those regions anyway. Um, in fact, I should remove that from the config explanation because that doesn't make sense. Then, uh, basically, in OpenSim, it's safe because we don't run untrusted code in that manner. They yes, they both use .net net, net, net thread, but it's basically just the difference is just a security check essentially between the two as far as I as from all the stuff I've read and I'm, I don't pretend to be a complete expert in uh, .NET thread pooling so from a diva distro I suspect that uses smart thread pool just like OpenSim default does currently yes they're both w really Windows settings I uh, as I said I think uh, there's reports on mono they're fine but there's other reports that says they're not and hence we kind of default to smart thread pool but on Windows you could get better performance with the kind of unsafe queue user work item Yes, yes, there is a performance difference, but that's what it is, as Robert says. Um, so the first setting, yeah, as I was saying, combine contiguous regions, that's the mega region setting, set to true if you want to try mega regions, and they are useful in some circumstances. And there are bugs, but I think some of those bugs we can overcome. So actually, I think, I think there are definitely things that could be fixed with mega regions, but they are kind of like, they are exploiting stuff that the viewer is doing, but which was, never, which was not really meant to be done in the way that we're doing it. Okay. So, yeah, I know, unsafe, just because it's a very technical thing, and maybe unsafe is not the word we should be using. We've kind of directly exposed the kind of .NET settings, but maybe they're not really necessarily suitable in this context. Okay, so, so I was going to talk about robust settings on startup, for instance, and these would be actually a little difficult, perhaps, if we can't see them. I really should have taken into account that it might be difficult. Um, but basically, these are actually. I can just paste a little few of the features in the chat. Yeah, some of them do have pretty crazy names, partly because they are pretty crazy, and um, actually using them is not always the best thing. Um, right. So by service list, service list is actually a relatively new thing in OpenSim. It's something that Melanie changed to make it actually easier to to see all the configuration of connectors. So I'm actually going to. Oh God, I didn't mean to post that. Right, it's a bad idea. Um, sorry about that. That was the whole file. And that was it again because, because Synergy is not being very happy moving between. Right, that's a bit better. So I was only going to post one example. So service list is actually a list of connectors which, connect, which uh, controls which DLLs are used to connect to grid services. So this is something one would specify in robust.ini. And these are the things which actually ex say, for instance, in this case, the asset service connector it says we want to use the, um, the asset service connector class from the DLL OpenSim server handlers.dll. And the port we want to use is 8003. And another one, for instance, um, the login service connector, if I attempt to paste that without repasting every single line I have here, because people in the, right, people in, looking at the doc can see it. Um, so at a login service connector, for instance, um, uses port 8002 in this case and uses that class service in connector. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. And, uh, and uses the handlers.dll. And the, the important thing to note here, so this is where you can change your port numbers. 
So if you want to use a completely different port for uh, logging, for instance, this is where one would end up changing it. But you have to be very careful that you're exposing. And this is not, to be honest, this is a deficiency in OpenSIM because it relies on on being very careful as to not exposing your kind of private grid ports. But for instance, the login has to be accessible by somebody externally for anybody to log in, for instance, to your grid. So 8002 is the default. But the kind of internal services, if you're not running an open grid like um, like OS Grid, for instance, where you can kind of take other measures to, to uh, kind of uh, kind of counteract any issues. But it, for instance, uh, if you wanted to use a different port, well, sorry, the asset service really only needs to be accessible by internal regions. And so it uses the port 8003, which you would not want to expose by default kind of through your firewall to anybody with a viewer. So one can change those numbers, but one has to be careful that one is properly firewalling against that. And that, to be honest, is a weakness because it does rely on being careful and relying on people being careful is, and to be to be honest, I'm not very careful. This is the thing, you know, relying on users like that is not the best of ideas. But anyway, that's how it is right now. So I, for some reason, have gone back to slide one, which is good. Uh, I think that was user error, though. Okay, so one second while I progress through slides. All right, slide eight, that's great. I've clicked it too many times. All right. If you'll be doing me the honor of appearing, that would be great. Uh, no, that's not the best slide I wanted. Um, 12, sorry. Oh, I see, yes, because I misordered the slides originally, I actually managed to hit the end, I think, of the deck. But I really did want to start at the beginning, so if that's the case, we will only be a second here. All right, yep, that we see, we saw. That, of course, we saw. And slide 16 was coming up right now. There we go. Right. Okay. And now I'm going to talk about uh, some of the X Engine settings, which are some of the in probably the most interesting settings. So X Engine, as and to be honest, that title is not correct. The uh, presentation has corrected my double capitalization where I didn't really want it to. I find that kind of thing tremendously annoying. Um, so this is about X Engine, which is OpenSIM's one and only currently kind of scripting engine. And hence, of course, is the default. Um, so it so the X Engine setting in OpenSIM.ini. Um, controls, controls of course, how X Engine works. So one of the most interesting settings here is one called App Domain Loading. Um, and App Domain Loading basically controls whether scripts are loaded in the same or separate app domains. Now, by this, by being true, basically every script gets its own kind of container, if you like. And sorry if, uh, for the people who really do know the real technical guts of this, but each script gets its own container. And hence, when a script actually has to go from a region, it can be unloaded from memory. So you don't get scripts which are no longer used. Say somebody's you know, deleted the object with the script in and it, can, and it can be unloaded. They don't hang around and take up memory in your simulator until you restart it. So that sounds like a great idea. Why isn't that always a good thing? Well, the reason is that on mono, at least, it takes a very long time, relatively speaking, to actually load into those separate app domains. So say you have... 1600 scripts on startup in, in mono that would take a very long time i don't know if anybody's ever experienced this but that would take you know 10 minutes or something to actually load up if you have app domain loading equals true and that's because mono i expect goes about this in a rather different way to net um and we end up with it taking a long time and it takes so long that to be honest uh, certainly in a lot of the situations i've been in it's kind of nice to just to say no load everything into the same app domain and of course, that takes nowhere near the same, the same amount of time. You know, it takes, I don't know, maybe a 20th of the time to actually do that, on mono at least. So, but then of course you end up leaking memory because when you unload a script, you can't any, any longer unload the app domain. You've kind of, you can't unload its container, you've got to keep it around. Now, in theory, we could improve this by, say, loading all, all scripts in, in the region into the same app domain, and then anybody coming in with an attachment of a script and load that into a different app domain so they can be unloaded. Because one of the common memory leaks, of course, is that when somebody, leaves a, when somebody has scripted attachments and they leave your region, then you really want to up and unload those scripts, ideally. But if you can't, well, the, memory, the usage of memory just hangs around. And to be honest, it's not a huge amount of memory. You may not even notice it, but it's one of these things which, which can be annoying because there's no way to reclaim it. So that might be a setting 
right, and now I need to go to the beginning. That might be a setting you might be interested in actually changing. By default, in OpenSim.ini, it's set to load everything in the same app domain because of this. Um, yeah, never ever garbage collected. It can't be. It's just kept around in the, in the same app domain as every other script. Um, and that's the issue. Exactly. You can't get rid of it unless you load it in its own app domain. So that's something by default um, that's set to... Um, that's set to actually load in every app domain is true in a default open sim. But if you if you find your scripts are really taking a long time to load and you don't really care about maybe leaking a little bit of memory over time, then you might want to try setting that to false. So yeah, on Windows it's nowhere near the same issue. It's actually a lot quicker to actually load into into app domains. So it's one of these things where you kind of can kind of try it. Um, Okay, so the next setting I want to talk about is delete scripts on startup, which is another X engine setting. So originally, uh, maybe um, maybe back in the 073 days, or maybe a little earlier, um, all scripts are always deleted and recompiled when you restarted OpenSim, and this was to avoid issues if some of the OpenSim code changes. And uh, yeah, exactly, it's only really an issue on Mono. Um, yeah, this was a, this was to avoid a problem if the OpenSim code changes. And your scripts are still assuming the the uh, the older version of the code, and so they end up f failing with strange errors when you kind of restart them, or you restart the sim. Sorry, they end up failing with strange errors when you restart the simulator if you're kind of updating from the um, from the source co control repository directly. Um, so I think Kitely actually um, Owen Hervitz from Kitely came along and contributed to the patch, which said, well, you can actually set this to false so that. Um, you don't kind of delete all scripts and recompile. Um, and yeah, I should go through my slide. Basically, if you delete and recompile, you still preserve state because that's actually a separate file. You don't kind of lose your state information necessarily, but it does take a long time. So what Owen, Owen did is introduce a setting called delete scripts on startup, um, which one can set to false, of course. And I know you know what that looks like, but I'm going to do type in chat anyway. Um, so you could set that to delete scripts on startup equals false. And then you don't end up recompiling every script on startup. And that, again, is a lot quicker. If you don't need to recompile everything, your, your startup's not going to take anywhere near as long, especially if you have thousands of thousands upon script of, of uh, individual scripts. So that is perfectly safe. If you're using a release version of OpenSim, it's perfectly safe to enable that because your underlying code is not changing. You're, you're using a, a stable version. Um, of course, then you need to watch out if you upgrade. Uh, OpenSim, and you're using and you're upgrading in place. You're using exactly the same thing. You're not doing a, an approach like kind of transferring always across or anything. Um, then you need to watch out that you don't get strange errors if you did have that setting and you did change the underlying code. So basically, on on an actual binary installation of OpenSim, uh, that is actually set to false. We don't delete scripts and start it because if you're using a binary, we kind of assume well. You're not changing. You're just using the binary. You're not actually changing the source and recompiling it all the time. The underlying OpenSim source. Um, so that's set to false. But in the source, um, actually, and this might be something to to slightly change. I think in the source distribution, for instance, it's still set to true. So you kind of keep redeleting. So if you do find you're recompiling on each startup and you don't think you really need to, then you can set that to false, and it might be a lot quicker. Or it would be a lot quicker if you've got a lot of scripts. Right. Oh, yeah, well, uh, co-op is one of the experimental ones I was actually going to talk about, but we can quickly at the end, because uh, maybe I'll quickly mention it now. If you've ever looked at, and this is actually only in development OpenSim versions, um, I'm not going to get too off track here, but basically, and I'm and now scrabbling around in my own uh, files because I would actually like to uh, refer to what the file itself says, because even though I wrote it, it doesn't mean I can actually remember it. Um, Defaults, I think, still, was it? So there's basically a setting called, uh, yeah, script stop strategy, which can either be as it is now abort, or it can be, sorry, it should be abort, of course, or it can be co op. Now, this is an experimental setting in X Engine, um, which basically controls how we stop scripts. So abort means that we actually abort the threads running the script directly, we, we kind of yank it out no matter what it's doing at the time. Um, and co-op actually waits for, because basically X-Engine works by compiling NSL down to C-sharp and then running the C-sharp directly, there's no kind of nice way to actually get the threads to stop in the middle of operations. So 
one way is to get the feds to continually check uh, a state flag effect so your flag saying should you should I, should i stop now uh, should i not so if you do co-op for instance they keep they start checking that flag rather than aborting in the middle perhaps of doing something um and that can be a can be more stable in certain, certainly the reason i actually developed this and the reason i developed it because actually the 3d avatar school people who if you're in an early presentation I, I was working for we were we were suffering this issue and it was causing unreliability on sims and so it turned out to be uh, well, at least certainly it seemed to be that if you start aborting script threads, you can end up with nasty kind of conditions where you're kind of leaving issues in the runtime where the state is not consistent if you just end up aborting threads. And this is kind of documented on the web as well. And I, I know I'm, I'm not sure it's strictly in the MSDN, which Dali will say, well, and then it's not actually there, you idiot. Um, but it is an issue, you know, quite a lot in Stack Overflow threads and that kind of thing, where if you abort the threads, kind of in the middle of doing something, you can leave the, the virtual runtime in a bad state, and that can cause issues later on. Now, actually, abort has been on for so long, it's not usually a, a huge issue. Um, but there are situations, and, and maybe it's different on Windows, because we were using Mono a lot, and Mono, it certainly can occur in certain circumstances, um, but quite rarely, in that if you end up aborting a thread, um, you end up in difficulties. Now, abort is kind of stands bad. It, we do actually wait for threads to complete a little while. We don't literally go and abort them straight away. So, so in many, many, many cases, the thread does stop properly, and we don't end up aborting the thread. And then in many, many cases, even if you abort the thread, it's absolutely fine. It's not actually an issue. But there's kind of a one in a, I don't know, maybe one in a thousand or more where it can be an issue. So, yeah. So co-op is the alternative, but it's not ready. It's still I'm still flagging it as experimental because I haven't quite fully worked out the migration strategy if you if you switch the flag. And to be honest, the migration isn't that complicated. You just have to recompile all the scripts. In fact, one of the one of the ways is to say delete scripts on startup, as we saw earlier, equals true, and then actually delete the scripts and uh, and recompile. But I, I don't know. I wasn't quite I wasn't quite ready to flip the switch, but it's something definitely I'm considering doing um, at some point. Right, so I'm going to get back on message. Um, so I'm very briefly going to talk about the function threat level kind of settings. Now, everybody, if anybody has ever tried to use a, an open script, um, sorry, an open sim script function, they're probably cursed. I shouldn't say cursed. They're, they're probably they're, they're familiar with this functionality where function threat level is a number of kind of different. So each open sim kind of script is classified by its perceived possible threat level to the simulator, and in many contexts, this is very sensible because, because as you can imagine, there's a there's a lot of if once you allow complete strangers to come, if you're allowing complete strangers or, or pretty complete strangers to come on your sim and run their own scripts, then that's a pretty that's a pretty scary thing to do, to be honest. That's a that's a really complicated thing to do. Um, yeah, so so kind of, I think, I mean, I do think it's sensible. A lot of these functions, if you've ever seen, are kind of labeled with different threat levels. Um, so, for instance, um, I think OS Teleport Agent would be kind of maybe a popular one, which has caused difficulties in the past. So, for, you can imagine OS Teleport Agent is a pretty interesting function because it allows you to teleport anybody to anywhere. Um, there are There is some, one kind of restriction, but it's still a pretty pretty strong function. So, for instance, that would be the URL. And that has a threat level of severe, um, severe being the highest because it, it does allow people to do a lot of <laughs> teleport anybody anywhere, which is a pretty high high power. So, so by default, the function threat level is none. I think even OS um, functions are not enabled by default. But one way to enable that is to kind of turn the levels to severe, but then severe kind of enables it for everybody on your sim, which you really might not want. So kind of a way of controlling this is there's a, there's a, there's a kind of a way of allowing certain function names to only be executed by certain people. So, for instance, in the slide here, in the slide here, it says, uh, you know, you can control it by user UID. That's what that means. Or you can say certain things like, and I think oh, the, the name of the person who's contributed to this kind of slips to my mind, but you can basically say parcel group members, only par members of the parcel group can execute this function. Um, or only the parcel owner, if the, assuming the sim is over, sorry, the script is over, a parcel, and then the, only the owner of that owner of that parcel can actually execute, say, OS Teleport Agent, for instance, or maybe in the, the estate manager, or that kind of thing. And also, you can do it by creators. So only maybe only creators of a certain script um, 
can actually execute OS Teleport Agent. And some of these are blunt because you need to do it by UUID, which is not necessarily very portable between simula- for, between grids, for instance. But, you know, there are, there are ways of controlling this and probably it needs to be more fine-grained, but there are settings there. If, if you've ever needed to kind of think about that, there are ways of controlling it. So login service, I'll go over very briefly. The map tile URL, basically, uh, when we get to kind of later versions of viewers, they actually end up communicating with the grid, the the uh, the map service directly to fetch their map tiles. If you've ever kind of logged in and not been able to see any map tiles, that's one of the reasons why. And there, you will provide a URL to actually um, actually be able to get to those map tiles. So maybe you'd say map tile URL equals um, and then your external IP, and this will be an external IP, uh, for instance. Um, I think that's it. Sorry, I should refer to my notes quickly. Um, so, uh, sorry, I'm lost amongst my, I should really have shut down some of these windows. That really would have been a good idea. Okay. Um, so map tile URL, actually, you know, that's the wrong kind of URL you see. I've kind of, so, so for instance, what it's set to by default is 0019000 because that's the standalone, but, and there shouldn't be the quotes at the end. But in another case, you might want to, you need to, you, if anybody's externally accessing your grid, they need to be able to reach this particular address. So say if if your, if your external address was for some unlikely reason that, sorry, and you were using a standard and you'd do something like that so that people can actually see map tiles on later versions of the viewer, which is probably most versions nowadays are kind of like later than, than Linda Lab Viewer 2. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to check. I think that's actually the last slide. People might be familiar. Let me move back. Yeah, that's the last one. Okay. Um, with Grid Info Service, which is a setting either in um, standalone, uh, standalone com.ini for standalones, for instance, or for robust, robust.ini, and, and probably for um, hgrobust.hd.ini. Um, Yes, there's, there's all kinds, of, and Robert is probably very familiar with these config files. I think he know, actually knows more about it than I do. Um, so grid info service is a way of, of actually having your grid return some URLs to a viewer, for instance, a viewer that actually implements this so that it can display, for instance, the uh, splash page, if you've ever wondered how, um, how when in the grid manager, you know, you select um, OS grid and it comes up with a nice kind of OS grid splash page, or, or even the conference grid that has a splash page as well. But in the grid info service section, um, basically, yes. So the section called uh, grid info service. Yep. Um, so there are settings like, for instance, uh, the login URL, which is usually a, a pretty important one. So I'm going to say uh, my grid.com port 9000, for instance, which should um, we should advertise the uh, the login URI to the to um, to the uh, grid manager and stuff like the grid name, for instance, um, and probably the one we've just talked about, the welcome page, um, which is the uh, the splash page, which for some reason in my config says it's currently unused, which I think is a complete is a complete lie. This is one of the confusing things about a config file. Sometimes there's comments which don't get updated, and that one needs to be updated. So something like, um, for instance, well, it shouldn't be the colon there. Apologies. Um, would kind of take would 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 allow you to put up an HTML page where people could see um, could actually get a nice page when they click on something in a grid manager, for instance, and and look at your grid. So that's all these stuff I had. I'm, I'm very sorry about the presentation difficulties. I probably shouldn't have experimented kind of like that because it was pretty difficult. It's kind of a, a lesson learned. But thank you very much for paying attention. And uh, and I think we're probably probably at the end now. But to be honest, since there isn't another session, if there are any, if anybody does want to talk about, if anybody's curious about any particular config parameter and they want to nail me, try me to nail me to the spot now, then please ask in the chat. Otherwise than that, thank you very much. Right. Yes, uh, Ken. And that's one, again, that's one I'm not that familiar with. It's one of these settings I've never played with. Um, so I know, in fact, even on this grid, people, uh, even this grid, there's been a bit of experimentation um, about that, trying to get 
things to res in the right order. Um, so in fact, if I looked at the one for this region, um, we're in breakout three, aren't we? So config show, um, is it in startup? I think it probably is. So this is um, update prioritization scheme. Uh, 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 in fact, are we even using anything other than the default? Uh, is that in the startup section? Okay. Probably look at my own uh, dot any file very quickly. Um, so prioritization. Oh no, so that's an interest management, right? Okay. Yes, and grid, this grid, for instance, it's actually set front back. So I believe what that means is that um, the objects and, and, and things nearest your avatar are kind of sent to you first and then kind of the ones further away from you. But I'm slightly hypothesizing here. The, uh, I believe the best avatar responsiveness um, is the idea that, yeah, I think it's meant to do AV res first, but again, it might be one of these settings that's not quite working as well as it could. Um, right, so joining the hypergrid... Um, so on the hypergrid, that's another world to itself almost. So so if you if you did that, for instance, it's um one needs to use the robust.h.any. Um there are this is one of the areas which is kind of quite quickly evolving because as you might have seen in the other talks, Chris is putting in all these kind of extra security things and that kind of thing. I do have to echo Melanie. Um hypergrid, you've got to be very careful. You you it's one of these things you, you, you suddenly open up your system to being connected to by anybody else and and there is the potential for kind of problems there. We don't haven't seen a huge number of them, but it is a very complex thing. So you probably want to check out carefully the uh the hypergrid files. Unfortunately I probably can't really give you any really great advice at this point. But there are probably a, a good few settings you should look at. Um Right, any, um, yeah, absolutely. If you're using any of these config things, I know it's really complicated. And, and I, I do agree. I think people have been talking about config being really complicated. Um, I kind of, I'm kind of ambivalent. Funny enough, I'm kind of ambivalent about that because, as I said at the beginning, we do need to do a lot of, people want to do a lot of different things with these systems. And doing them through configuration is the way. And by making it kind of easy in one context, you make it maybe a bit harder in another. Um, so if you made it easy, I mean, standalone tries to be the easiest, but if you made it easier for grid, for instance, then standalone might become difficult. So we have all these kind of different mechanisms for changing these files, but they do become a bit complex. And, and to be honest, that's one of the things I always kind of thought, well, maybe a downstream distribution can, like Divas, for instance, set up, sets up a, a very different kind, kind of config and can do that because of the way we kind of allow a lot of things to change. And and maybe that some of these downstream things do make it simpler because they either do it automatically or they kind of only present a much more restricted set of parameters. So maybe that's the way, maybe it isn't because it does it does make things kind of complicated elsewhere. Yeah, it can be hard to figure out. I mean, it does allow you, the more config parameters you have, the more the more room you have to shoot yourself in the foot. And we try and we try and make that a bit simpler by having that defaults file. So that there's a whole bunch of stuff in there that hopefully you never need to see or change unless you're really interested in kind of trying an experimental setting or something like that. Um, but but that kind of does have the trade-off of, of having yet another config file which you're kind of looking at. And and if you do want to use those settings, then you need to start copying and pasting and, and working out what well, is this overriding that thing and that kind of thing. So, you know, there's a lot of trade-offs going on here. Yes, I mean, vanilla open sim gear is kind of, I mean, and you know, that is for kind of the experts, really, in a sense. I mean, when we produce a release, for instance, I do... I do I do fiddle with a few of the config settings to make it simpler. Like for instance, as I kind of mentioned earlier, the delete scripts on startup becomes false, whereas whereas in in the uh, source tree it's true. Um, so there's a few things we fiddle with for the actual releases. Um, but yeah, I mean if you're using kind of the source the OpenSim Git code, and um, it is more complicated. But I think that's kind of I don't know. It's hard to do anything about this without causing problems elsewhere. I think. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, the distributions do do make it simpler. They do make it 
um, and, open, and, and open stuff, which is always, you know, because it's the OS grid distro, is always pretty cutting edge, um, if one did want to stay with that. And to be honest, I think Robert was saying earlier, and this is something I didn't put in the presentation, there was actually, and I didn't actually realize, this is one of the things I didn't realize, this was this is code in there since 2009, but there is a hidden piece of code to read um, a config directory. If you have a config directory, you can actually put an any file in that to actually override things without having to change your OpenSim.ini, for instance, which can be handy if you if you don't want to reintegrate, if you're following OpenSim releases and you don't want to reintegrate all your settings every time. Because I know we do this, do this annoying thing where we say, well, if you change anything and you upgrade OpenSim, you've got to manually port all your changes over. You can't just dump in your ini file. And we say that because in the past we've found that when somebody does that, there's a hot, there, if, because there are a lot of settings, if somebody does that and and there's a new setting being introduced with a default which which doesn't actually work with their other settings, then you can end up, as somebody said earlier in the chat, you can end up with obscure errors which are very difficult to pin down. Um, so maybe maybe that's something we could look at and actually having, because that config directory does actually seem quite a good idea. If you can actually dump your settings in there and kind of, this is kind of taking the defaults one layer further almost though, but maybe that's not a bad thing. Um, you kind of dump your settings in there and they end up overriding, well, whatever's an open sim or any, and that ends up overriding defaults. And you've got another layer, but maybe maybe that would make sense. So, I mean, there is probably room for improvement. Yes, bullet sim is another, would have been another interesting setting. Maybe I should have mentioned that, um, which is the default, the alternative physics engine in open sim, um, which uh, Robert Adams of... Uh, who uh, who is here has has worked on uh, on, an, on an awful lot because that is a really complicated area in itself, but that is kind of shaping up nicely. But it's still not the default because uh, you know changing physics engine is is kind of I mean it's, it is a complicated piece of code and you want to make sure then it's it's going to be pretty it's going to be working pretty well. And ODE I mean and bullet sim is definitely getting there very quickly. Um, so when he, and I, and the plan is after the next release, then Bulletstorm will become the default pretty promptly. And it will end up being the default soon. Um, but right now, one can still experiment with it. In 0.7.5, I think it was still pretty raw. But in current development code, now let me just find the setting, actually, if anybody isn't familiar with it. Um, it's very early on. It's kind of right up at startup. Um, right. So startup section. So it's the one, if you're going, if you're going to startup and... Let me find it properly. And okay, interesting. It's not in mine, probably because I've done styling slightly wrong. I'm looking at the wrong file. I expect I shouldn't look at the yeah. I'm looking at the defaults file. It doesn't really help. Okay. Um, right. I mean, there's a setting. Uh, yeah, in the startup. So in the startup section where it says physics. Yeah, exactly. Mark has just pasted it in. Uh, the default is open dynamics engine, but if one wanted to experiment with bullet sim, then you just uncomment the bullet sim line, sorry, and comment out the open dynamics engine line. So if I were to, well, if I paste that, it won't work. But basically, uh, yeah, basically you uncomment the bullet sim line by removing the semicolon, as I'm sure you're aware, and comment the open dynamics engine line by putting in a semicolon at the start. And uh, and then you'd be trying the bullet sim engine. And in 075, it was still probably pretty raw, really. Um, but certainly in, in current development code, it is, it's come along uh, an awful long way. And in fact, it's what we're using in the conference when I say this. And we are actually using bullet sim. So that's how good it is. We are, we've been able to run this whole conference on that. So really, you'd say, yeah, it's, it is actually getting there, Justin. It probably should be the default. But me being the conservative person that I am, um, I think it would be nice just to put one final release out with ODE and then very quickly kind of switch over and I'm just double checking that that is the case and I've not just told you the wrong thing um, default scripting and yes there we go physics equals bullet sim um, so actually this is probably something I should go through say very quickly if you've ever wanted to see exactly what config open sim is actually using from all these config files at a terminal you can type config show and that will show that will probably it will be quite a lot it will show you the entire actual loaded config settings but if you say, if you want a particular section, if you say config show startup, for instance, that would show you only the startup section of config. So that's one way of checking what has actually been loaded from all those different .ini files um, into config. So thank you very much, everybody. I know we're at 31 past the hour now, so we're at the official end. 
And uh, for the people who are still here, thanks a lot for coming to the conference. It's been, uh, it's been it's worth a lot better than I think we could possibly have hoped for. So that's been really, really great. We had a few hiccups, of course, like the keynote one today. But apart from that, it's been, uh, and, and, a, and a few little other odds and ends, but really nothing that can be handled. So it's gone remarkably well. And of course, a lot of this has been kind of performance improvements lately to get the conference going, but all this will be in the next release, which hopefully won't be, won't be too far behind. We'll, we'll come out pretty soon now. So thanks very much.